quite there yet. That's a phase in which we can speak of subspecies or races. In botany, they are called varieties, but the concept is the same. So groups of individuals of the same species who are going to become different species, but have not completed the process. <clears throat> you can understand that a concept like this is rather difficult to define in practice. But in fact, we have a set of good examples of species who are or are not subdivided in some species, in subspecies or races. One good example comes from our closest uh, evolutionary neighbors, the chimps. Now we have two species of chimps, the pygmy chimp or bonobo, which occupies the area in red in this map, and then the common chimpanzee. And I would like to talk briefly about uh, the common chimpanzee. The four areas in the map that you see in different colors, yellow, blue, green, and pink, correspond to four different genetic groups of chimps. In other words, <clears throat> if you take this chimps DNA and you study some specific areas in this DNA, an expert can tell you with very high precision, I'm not sure if it's 100% or 99%, which area that chimp comes from whether from the yellow area, the blue, the green, or the pink area. So here we have a species <clears throat> in which it's possible to place uh, unknown individuals on the map based on their DNA with a very limited uh, statistical error. So in this case, uh, the concept of the subspecies uh, is justified, as is justified to give them a name. So the yellow one are called pan troglodytes, these are genus and species of the chimpanzee, Verus. The blue ones are called uh, Pantroglodites elioti. Uh, the green ones, uh, Pantroglodites troglodytes, and the pink ones, uh, Pantroglodites schweinfurti. You have several examples of a subdivision of this kind in the living world. For instance, uh, in the Pyrenees, the snails, are genetically different in every valley. So in the Pyrenees, a snail expert uh, can tell you with good precision which valley an unknown individual comes from. So even <clears throat> among the, the land snails, uh, um, the concept of the subspecies of race holds and it's useful biologically because it allows you to classify individuals. Now you know that snails are not famous for their speed in moving from one place to another nor for the distance they can travel through. So I will not uh, get into detail here, but I think uh, uh, it will be obvious uh, that you have this subdivision in subspecies whenever there are barriers uh, that the individuals do not cross. So isolation is a crucial factor in the evolution of this type uh, of entities, which we call subspecies or races. Now, are all the species of the living world structured like chimps or like snails? No, they aren't, no, they aren't. Here you see the <coughs> yellow thin tuna. Probably you are more familiar with it in the canned version that you find in the supermarket. Anyway, these are remarkable, remarkable creatures. A yellow thin tuna can travel at a speed of 70 kilometers per hour. And in the sea, there are no barriers. So they can go wherever they want within a certain climatic uh, area. Now, <clears throat> there is a lot of genetic uh, differentiation among yellowfin tuna. They are as different as we are, or perhaps more different. But there is no way to attribute an individual to one of the three main oceans, Atlantic, Pacific, Indian, because these guys go around all the time. And so you can fish in the Pacific Ocean someone who comes from a different ocean. So highly mobile species, such as many fishes of the sea, many birds, many birds, don't show the structure, the subdivision in different subspecies that we observed in the, in the chimpanzees and that we would like to, to measure in humans. That's why the attempt to classify 
human races has been largely unsuccessful for history. And this is one of the two reasons, the second one is genetic, but one of the two reasons why experts in this field do not believe that race is a valuable concept in biology, that it serves any, any purpose. The first attempt to, to, you know, to classify humans in races in a scientific manner comes from the work of Karl von Limne, the Swedish naturalist, who was the first one who tried to classify all human beings and rocks, all, all, excuse me, all organisms, so animals and plants, and even rocks. <clears throat> Linné or Linnaeus was the one who decided to give us name and surname. Our name is uh, Sapiens, our surname is Homo, our genes. And his uh, enormous work of classification is continued now whenever someone finds a new species of plants or animals. For Linné, the work was relatively easy because he had no idea of evolution. We are in the 1700s and uh, essentially all scientists believed to the biblic uh, tale of the creation. So animals and plants were created as different as they are now, which simplified in a sense the work uh, of classification because you just had to find the right name for each of them. <clears throat> Linnaeus uh, uh, published 13 editions of his uh, main book called Sistema Nature, the system of nature, <clears throat> which expanded from 13 pages in the first edition to more than 2000 in the last edition published during his lifetime. And only in the 10th edition, Linnaeus uh, proposed a system of classification of human races, uh, dividing us in four races. So the numbers you will see from now on represent the number of uh, races in the catalogs that we will be looking at. <clears throat> um, Linnaeus proposed that uh, there is a European race, a Mongolian race in Asia, an African race, and an American race. Australia was not well known at his time, so he didn't mention it. And uh, why four races? Well, Linnaeus says that it's because there are four elements in classic Greek philosophy. Air, water, fire, and earth. And you may ask, okay, what's the connection? I don't know. I don't know. But I'm uh, mentioning this uh, because it shows uh, that uh, whenever we are studying not a snail or a plant, but ourselves, we may be tempted uh, to mix up scientific and less scientific considerations. It's very difficult to talk of ourselves uh, with the same detachment uh, that we easily find when we are talking about some other organism. <clears throat> So Linnaeus proposed four human races, basically corresponding to the four main continents, excluding Australia. Australia entered <coughs> in the play with Blumenbach, who was a German anatomist and medical doctor. Blumenbach studied the collection of skulls of crania of the University of Göttingen in Germany. And uh, he based uh, his classification on an aesthetic criteria, on the beauty of these skulls. He thought that uh, the most beautiful of these skulls uh, were all from the same continent. And I will let you guess uh, which continent he had in mind. Ours, of course, Europe. So he said that uh, the European skulls are much better than the others, look much nicer than the others. Mind you, he was not a racist, and he insisted that his classification didn't include a ranking of the races. We were simply the most beautiful. And because the most beautiful of these beautiful skulls came from the Caucasus, from Georgia, he invented the term Caucasian, which is now used as a synonym to European. So when you hear people speaking about uh, the Caucasian race or the European race, uh, these two words uh, are exactly the same. Then according to Blumenbach, there was a progressive process of the degeneration of these perfect uh, ideal skulls, leading to the origin of the American and of the Asian race. They were neither 
bad, no good. And then an, a successive process of further degeneration led to the origin of the African and Australian races. <clears throat> Other people had in mind the simpler classification systems. Here you have a sort of hit parade of the great naturalists of the 18th and 19th century. Georges Cuvier was uh, the father of comparative anatomy. And uh, he said, no, things are as simple. We have three races, yellow, white, and black. And even uh, Immanuel Kant uh, gave his contribution, even though I suspect uh, we cannot rank it among the most significant contributions to the field, proposing four different races, which, however, didn't correspond to the uh, races proposed by Linnaeus. The 17th and 18th, uh, the 18th and 19th century are also the centuries of great explorations. <clears throat> Travelers traveled, explorers explored the world. When they came back to their university in uh, Europe or in North America, they came back with the, a description of uh, new populations which could hardly be fitted within the existing races. And so the catalogs, the racial catalogs, began to expand and to include more and more different races. Here you can see a map dating back to the half of the 19th century. And the number 27 means that there are 27 little heads to the sides showing the different types. Type is another crucial world in this business, meaning that uh, you know, all of us are sort of uh, approximate reflections of a certain idea. It's a, it's a platonic system, in, in a sense. <clears throat> and this platonic idea, to which all of us more or less correspond within a certain area, are our uh, types, our racial types. So by the mid-1800s, uh, uh, there were 27 different uh, human races, each of which corresponded to one of the territories in the map. In 1933, in Chicago, they had the, the Universal Exhibition. And the curators of the Fields Museum of Natural History asked an artist from New York, her name was Malvina Hoffman, to uh, produce for the exhibition uh, statues, statues of all human races. Um, Malvina Hoffman was a serious person, and she said, I can't. I have, to, you know, I have no idea how many human races exist. And therefore, it was decided that she would travel across the world, accompanied by the anthropologists of the museum, and give a look to the human populations all over the world. When she came back from this long trip, Maldina Hoffman produced 103 statues. So you can see them in detail in, <clears throat> in the lower part of this picture. Uh, which were shown during the exhibition and then you know, preserved for a certain number of years in the Fields Museum in Chicago. And then uh, these rooms were closed and some of the statues were actually destroyed, which is unfortunate. But uh, this shows how fast the number of human races uh, grew in, uh, in the last years. And uh, this uh, increase in number of the human races became embarrassing at a certain point. In the 20th century, we had a few classification systems, including 200 races. And it's very clear that uh, saying that there are 200 races or saying that we don't know what we are talking about uh, is more or less the same. It would be impossible to find in 200 drawers the place where you put your socks or <clears throat> and to decide in which drawer you want to put your socks if you have 200 drawers available. So there was a, a growing unhappiness with the classification systems, which was probably emphasized during the Second World War by the obvious political consequences of all these scientific exercises. So it's not surprising, I think at least to me, that the first reactions began to <clears throat> appear and uh, to be, become widespread in the 60s. I like this paper, not only because of its uh, very clear headline on the non-existence of human races, but also because it shows very, very clearly a different way to consider human variation. 
I don't know if you can read, and so I will read for you what I consider the most significant lines of this paper, just a three page paper. My students have to read it. Written by a great uh, US anthropologist called Frank Livingston. Frank Livingston wrote that his position doesn't mean that there is no biological variation between the organisms within a species, but just that this variability does not conform to the discrete packages labeled races. So he didn't mean, and nobody ever meant, that denying the existence of human races means to say that we are all equal, because we are not. Simply, we are not subdivided in discrete, in distinct packages. A package is the thing within which you buy your cell phone. And if it says uh, that the cell phone is a Samsung, then uh, inside it, uh, you will only find a Samsung cell phone, not a Motorola, not uh, something else. There is no package saying uh, here you will find a cell phone which is 25% uh, Samsung, 3% uh, uh, LG, and 29% uh, Nokia. No. Well, he said, we are not uh, shaped. Our structure cannot be compared to the structure of these uh, separated packages. His position, he writes, can be stated in other words as there are no races uh, in humans. There are only clans, meaning gradients. From <clears throat> Livingstone on, a different approach to the, the description of human diversity became possible. And from that moment on, an increasing number of scientists in anthropology and in genetics began to focus not on the grouping of people, but on the individual features of these people, discovering a number of very interesting things. So at a certain point, let's say at the beginning of the 70s, and there more clearly uh, in, the, in the current century, the DNA came into play. Now, perhaps what I'm going to say is useless, but in case someone who is not very familiar with DNA is participating to this meeting, I will spend a few words uh, about what DNA is. And um, one way to put it is that DNA is a molecule contained in each of our cells, which in turn contains the instructions to lead the single cell from which we originate, the egg cell of the mother, fecundated by the sperm of the father, to become the big bunch of cells, probably 30,000 billion cells, each of us, who we call ourselves. And then when this development has terminated, the DNA contains instructions to make this machine work until it doesn't work anymore and we die. <clears throat> The DNA has also been described as a text. And I think this is a very good metaphor. First of all, because uh, like a text, you know, a text uh, in, uh, in English <coughs> I'm sorry, is made of 26 letters plus uh, the, the spaces and the, you know, the, the interpunction. Well, much the same way the DNA is composed of four letters for molecules that are repeated in these long chains that we call chromosomes. These four molecules are called with the four letters A, C, G, and T. And so we can say that we know the alpha, we understand the alphabet of the DNA. We also understand the lexicon, the vocabulary of the DNA, because within our genome, genome is a word defining the complex of the DNA in each of our cells, Within the genome, there are probably 20,000 genes, each of which produces one or more proteins. And we are basically made of proteins and water, mostly water and proteins. <clears throat> so we know what the DNA does. We know the single words of the DNA. By knowing these words, so we, have, you know, we have learned to deal with some diseases. For instance, now we can identify at the genetic level Duchenne muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis, uh, Daltonism, which is a defect uh, in, the, in the vision of the colors, or hemophilia. Now, all these are very interesting diseases, but of course, most people don't die of them. People die of diabetes, people die of cancer, 
people die of uh, circulatory diseases and uh, of uh, neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer. So we would like to be able to identify at the DNA level these diseases and perhaps to prevent them or to develop therapies. And these we haven't been able to do because all these diseases and many other features of our body depend not on the action of a single gene like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but on the joint action of many, many genes and many environmental factors. For instance, you know that smoking is not a good thing if you want to avoid cancer. Now we, can, we don't know how to deal with the, this complexity yet. So we don't know the syntax of DNA. We don't know how many genes collaborate to create a certain aspect of our body. And that's you know, the area in which we are working very actively. Um, <clears throat> but still, even though we don't understand the many important aspects of the functioning of our genes, of our DNA, we can read all the DNA. This has become cheap and we shall see it in a moment. So let's say that we can read our genome as we would be reading a text in a language we don't know, but of which we have a vocabulary. The simple sentences we can understand, the more complicated ones we don't, but we read it all. I was forgetting to say that the DNA is a very, very long text. In each of our cells, it's composed of 6.5 billion characters. Now, to give you an idea, <clears throat> Don Quixote, according to an estimate, an approximate estimate I made, is uh, made of 3 million characters. So this means that the booklet of instructions within our cells is a library with uh, 2,000 volumes, each of which as thick as uh, Don Quixote. Uh, the cell finds the right line with the right thing to do in a matter of milliseconds or even nanoseconds. And that's another thing we would like to understand better. How can the cell be so good at reading the right line of extraction in the right moment? This is also something we hope uh, we shall discover in the future. But I was saying that uh, reading the DNA has become very, very cheap. And this is a sort of a timeline. The first uh, genome ever read HGP means Human Genome Project, it took 13 years, almost 3,000 scientists for a cost of $2.7 billion. But through year, the years, these methodologies have become incredibly cheaper and faster. So that now, if you want to read an entire genome, it takes one day uh, there is only a technician who has to press uh, some keys uh, in a big machine and the cost is less than $1,000. So we have begun to read many and many genomes. I cannot say how many genomes have been read so far. I would think uh, that we are approaching the, the million of genomes. But it's not clear because the private companies in, you know, in the big pharma area type a lot of genomes and don't make uh, the results public. So you know, it can be any number, but certainly we are above the 100,000 mark, and probably we are also above the million mark. And by <clears throat> comparing the genomes that are publicly available for scientific investigation, we have learned a lot of things on ourselves. I will mention just a few, I think four or five, but uh, well, there will be many more, many more to talk about. So the first thing that we have discovered is that if we compare these two people whom you have already met um, during my talk, they look very, very different to us. Actually, they look as different as two humans may be, but we know that they have in common 99.9% .9 of their genes. A very large fraction of the genome is identical in all of us which is less the case in chimpanzees and gorillas. So chimpanzees and gorillas are now just a handful of thousand individuals in Africa, but they show a greater diversity than we do. And this tells us that in the past, their populations were very, very large. So the variable section of the genome is very, very limited. But even one per thousand, as in this case, 
is one per thousand of a very big number, is one per thousand of three billion uh, letters. You have to divide by two. Don't ask me why, it's complicated to explain, but you know, you have to take 6.5 billion divided by two, it becomes 3.2 billions. And then one per thousand means three million. So two of us, two random people, taken from the human population, on average, differ by three million features in their DNA, which is enough to justify a lot of our, of our differences. We know that many of these variants of the DNA... I, don't know. I, don't know. <clears throat> I can hear someone speaking. Okay. Many of these, of these variants in the DNA are cosmopolitan, so they are observed all over the world at different frequencies. For instance, I am O blood group, like I think 40% of you. O blood group is present all over the world, in all continents. So if you know of a person that this person is O blood group, you have no idea where this person comes from. The B blood group, conversely, is only present in Asia, Europe, and Africa, but not in the Native Americans or Australians. But 80% of our DNA variants are like the O blood group. So they are present all over the world. They are, we say, cosmopolitan. And this creates some strange consequences. Um, what I'm going to show to you right now, remember, is not the average case. It's something that may happen, is rather unusual, but it may happen. And I think it will show you why it makes no sense to speak about human races from the genetic standpoint. These are three of the first people whose DNA, whose genome was entirely studied and read. Uh, at the bottom, you see a famous geneticist, James Watson, the discoverer with Francis Crick and Rosalind Franklin of the double helix structure of the DNA. James Watson was the first one whose DNA was entirely read in, if I will remember, 2007 or 2008. A year later, another famous geneticist's DNA, Craig Venters, to the top left, was completely read. And a couple of years later, it was the turn of a Korean scientist. You see him to the right. His name is Kim, pretty much like 90% of his fellow countrymates. Now, <clears throat> Watson and Venter are American, but they are clearly of European origin, and you can see it. It shows. And at the same, in the same way, Kim is Asian, and it shows. You may not know exactly whether he's Chinese or Japanese or Korean. Maybe some experts can say that, but clearly he comes from Asia. Well, when you compare their DNA, as has been done in the paper by Kim, then something strange happens because these people have a number of DNA variants which are only present in their own genome, but not in the other two. So here, this number for Kim, 1,132,000, means that Kim has these variants which are not present either in Craig Venter's or James Watson's genomes. And so, you know, <clears throat> and it's the same for the two Americans. Then in the center, you have 1,254,000 variants that are shared by the three people. So these are variable in the human species, but the three guys have the same value. What is most interesting, I think, uh, is that uh, Craig Venter and James Watson, the two people of European origins, uh, share less variants uh, in the DNA, 460,000, than either of them shares with Kim, 480,000 for Venter, and almost 570,000 for Watson. So from the genetic standpoint, Kim, the Asian, is intermediate between Watson and Venter. If a scientist from the outer space came to Earth and began to study our species from these three guys, he would classify uh, Kim, together with Watson, excluding Venter, as the most likely grouping. Or, as a second option, Kim with Venter, excluding Watson. And the least likely grouping would be the two Europeans together and Kim separated from them. Now, this is an extreme case. <clears throat> in general, your neighbors are closer to you 
than people coming from different continents. But this is on average, and there's a lot of variation around this average. And so it may happen that people from a very distant area of the world cluster with people of a different area. So we may, I don't know if we may rejoice or be sad, but in any case, uh, we may think that someone in Mexico or South Africa or in Alaska is close to us genetically. I don't know if you will find this, uh, this idea reassuring or frightening, but uh, that's the way things are. To better understand so the nature of our differences, I would like to show you the results of a study <clears throat> by a group who worked in Sardinia and who compared to the left very common variants. So on the left you have comparisons in which the two variants in a position of the DNA whose frequency, of course, must be 100% combined, um, you have cases of common variants, like the O blood group. So here you have uh, situations in which you have 80-20 for the two variants, or 51-49, or something like that. And to the right, instead, you are comparing positions of the DNA in which one variant is very rare, 1% or less. The thick red lines to the left mean that neither of these populations can be shown to be different from the others. If you focus on the most common variants in our DNA, Sardinians are like Finns, like Britons, like Spaniards. On the other hand, if you focus on rare variants, then you can tell apart each of these populations, even Sardinians from Central Italians. So if you look at some special rare DNA variants, then you can find that they have a localized distribution, that they are present only in one population or even in a family. But the point is that these variants are rare and generally pathological. 99% of the Sardinians or Britons or Finns don't have these variants. So you cannot use these variants to define a group, to define a group of people. The most up-to-date description of our variation comes from this map, which is a little bit complicated. So I don't know if you want me to enter in detail here. I will do it superficially, and then if you want, we can go back. Here, for several populations, including populations of people who have recently migrated, like ASW to the left, is a black population in central United States. You have the DNA variants divided in private, so a specific of a single population in the bright color, specific of a single continent in the less bright color, and the gray shades represent the percentage of variants that are either shared across different continents or shared across all continents. And if you look at this map, you can see that the gray areas represent from 45% in Africa to almost 90% in certain other groups. So our diversity is broadly shared by many, many populations. Africans and some Asians have something more specific in their, in their DNA. Now the question is how we came to be like that. And uh, those of you who are experts in paleontology will forgive me because here I made some oversimplifications, but uh, I think it's worth doing it. Here you see something that can be seen as a picture of uh, the human forms on purpose, I don't use the word species because as we saw before, the concept of species is very, very slippery in this area. Let's say between 200,000 and 100,000 years ago. I pushed the timing of the thing in order to make a better map. Uh, so don't blame me for this. I know that there are errors here. But around uh, 200,000 years ago, um, Homo sapiens, and here you see some reconstructions of the aspect of these people made by some artists in, Hon in uh, the Netherlands. So their name is Kenny, so they are two, two twins. Homo sapiens, someone whose skull was pretty much like ours, were in Africa. And you see that uh, the area is not well defined because we don't, don't, really, don't really know, but we were just in Africa. In Europe, and in a rather large section of Asia, there were Neanderthals, the real Europeans, the people who occupied Europe for 300,000 years. 
Um, in Southern Asia, there was another well-known human form, known from the beginning of the 20th century, called Homo erectus. And then, and then there are the two, three new entries, Homo floresiensis in the south, discovered in 2006 in, uh, in Flores in Indonesia. The most recent addition is uh, the man from Luzon in the Philippines, uh, who joined the club in 2019. But uh, the most surprising of all is uh, the Denisova man. And in the picture, you shouldn't uh, pay attention to the hand. It's the hand of a researcher. But to the little black thing on the pinky finger of this lady. Um, <clears throat> A group of Russian archaeologists who were digging in a cave in Denisova looking for traces of Neanderthal occupation, a few years ago discovered two teeth and that little bone, and the teeth didn't look like Neanderthal teeth at all. In Siberia, in the cold climate of Siberia, the DNA is very well preserved. And so by destroying this little piece of bone, which turns out to be a fragment of a pinky, finger, so you know, the little finger here, they could extract high quality DNA, which didn't look like uh, Neanderthal or Homo sapiens DNA. So that was uh, genetic evidence uh, that in that area, a human group lived, which was neither Neanderthal nor sapiens, and which was called uh, Denisova man, Homo Denisova. And it's the first example of a species defined not based on its anatomy, which we don't know, because we only have two teeth and now I think they have found something else, like you know, little fragments of their bodies, but based on genome, on the DNA. So this was the picture some 200,000 years ago, perhaps Homo erectus was already, uh, had already disappeared or was confined to a smaller area, but let's not focus on these uh, minimal details. Around uh, 7,000 years ago, also here the datation is a bit controversial, and, but anyway, around 7,000 years ago, Homo sapiens leaves Africa and in, uh, in a very short uh, time period comes to occupy all the planet uh, and in the same time all these other human forms disappear. We didn't kill them uh, one by one, this for sure, but certainly their disappearance has something to do with our expansion out of Africa. And we know pretty well this expansion, <clears throat> both because we study the fossils and the tools that these people used, and because now we have uh, very good uh, genetic data on ancient people. So here you see 200,000 years ago, our remote ancestors uh, in Eastern Africa, perhaps also a bit to the south, then they expand. They move along the coast <clears throat> in Asia, they also go to Europe, they go up to the north, they walk into the Americas because at that time the level of the sea was lower and you can walk there, provided you could make a living on the ice. So these people were highly specialized people who could make a living pretty much like contemporary Inuit in a very hostile environment. Then there was a very fast movement towards South America, which we partly don't understand. In the meantime, someone has already arrived to Australia. Only Polynesia was colonized much later because to arrive here in Polynesia, you need to master navigation. You need to have boats. And that's why it took us so long to colonize all these islands. And in the next three slides, I will try to give you a summary of the 100,000 years of human evolution. You may say I'm crazy, but you know, that's the way science proceeds. When something is complicated, we try to make a model, a simplified version of reality, which may be right or wrong. Generally, it's wrong because we simplify things, but may help us think of processes that otherwise would be too complicated even to be imagined. And I'm using the slides that a colleague from Yale gave me a few years ago because I still think they are the best illustration of this process. It's a <clears throat> pointillistic representation of human diversity in the style of uh, Seurat, Signac, you know, these French painters of post-impressionism. So the colors in this map 
show that uh, between 150,000 and 100,000 years ago, there was already diversity in Africa. So the different colors mean that people were already genetically different. Perhaps this image is not accurate in that I don't think we were occupying all the territory, but you know, let's forget about the details. You see, there are differences in color, and just by chance, the area around the current Egypt is occupied by yellow and blue, blue uh, dots. Um, how was the life of these remote ancestors of ours? It was a very hard life. Humans began to produce food only 10,000 years ago. And we have been around for 190,000 years ago if we just focus on Homo sapiens, on people looking like us. So for 1819th of our story, we could only grab the food that was available. We could hunt and kill animals, or we could collect the spontaneous uh, fruits and roots that grew in, in our territory. We were hunter-gatherers. And uh, there are still a few populations in the world, in Africa, New Guinea, South America, who currently live as hunter-gatherers. So we could study them and we realized that, that these people are always on the move. They are always on the move because they enter an area, they exploit uh, the available resources in terms of food, and then they move to another place. So they are nomads <coughs> or semi-nomads. And by moving around, they explore the territory. So we have to keep in mind that these people didn't know where they were going. They had no maps. They had no idea they were in Africa, but they kept moving. And this way, at a certain moment, which we placed around 7,000 years ago, um, Ken Kid wrote 100,000 years ago, I would say 7,000, but these are details. Some of these people moved into the Near East. And into the Near East, they found a very favorable environment because the place was rich in resources and largely unoccupied by humans. Okay, there were a few Neanderthals, but Neanderthals were good people and we got rid of them fairly quickly. And then something happens that uh, Charles Darwin, who had no idea of the DNA, who had seen only one fossil in his lifetime, and it was not the real Neanderthal fossil, but a drawing of the fossil. Well, Charles Darwin was able to predict what would happen under these conditions, because he wrote that when resources are abundant, then there is a decrease in infant mortality. So the number of kids who reach the age of reproduction increases, and they live for longer because there is food. And this way, the population increases. Now, Darwin already foresaw this process, but if you look at this map now, you can realize that uh, those who moved uh, to the Near East were not a random sample of Africans. They were just a specific group, those who were previously occupying the Northeastern area of Africa. And so the people who moved uh, into Asia and expanded and came to colonize the whole world were largely the descendants of the yellow and blue spots that you see there. And that's why <clears throat> all over the world, we basically have a subset of African variation with several exceptions, of course. This is a very schematic model. Whereas in Africa, we have an almost complete collection of all human diversity. Of course, many other things happened in the process, but if this model is realistic, and I think it is, it shows us why we observed these levels of diversity in humans and why <clears throat> it turns out to be basically impossible to draw lines separating groups of biologically distinct populations. Uh, I don't know if I'm speaking too much, uh, Cecilia, am I speaking too much? Okay. Let me show you briefly, and then if you want, I can stop, <clears throat> why I think that this really matters. Because it, it may look like, you know, one of those exercises in which uh, some old people like me think about the things that happened uh, many, many years ago. Okay. In fact, this has an impact uh, on our health. And the example that uh, comes to my mind is the example of drug treatment. We all know, and uh, the pharmaceutical companies know, that if you treat a number of patients with the same drug at the same dosage, for a large part of them, there will be an improvement in the conditions. 
they are marked in blue in the skin, some of them in yellow will show no effect of the therapy, and a few of them may possibly have severe side effects. Uh, now we know that this depends on genetic variation, genetic polymorphism. Here you see some examples. You have the letters of the DNA and you see that the people who are not uh, improving their health after drug treatment have a C, where the other, the blue people, have a G. And maybe at another site of the DNA, those who have severe side effects have a G instead of a T. Uh, why is that so? Here I try to, to make a scheme of the mechanisms leading to the spread of a drug within our body. So the drug is the pink uh, ellipse. And here you have some genes marked with a DNA symbol producing proteins that transport the drug. The proteins are the yellow thing here. Transport the drug to the target. And then the drug reaches the target and this sort of lightning means that there is an interaction. Uh, an interaction with other proteins that are called the target proteins and that are on the surface of the cells that need be affected by the treatment. This is the part of the process that the pharmaceutical research is mostly focused on, but it's not the most important for the uh, problem we are talking about. Because then other genes produces drug metabolizing enzymes, proteins, that as you see cut the drug in pieces. And uh, here we find the differences uh, in uh, uh, the different, the most important differences uh, as far as uh, the reaction to drug treatment is concerned. Because some of us, uh, for every class of drugs, uh, do this fast. Some of us do this slowly. So those of us who are faster than average eliminate uh, the molecules of the drug because before they have made their effect. And so we don't benefit from the treatment. In other cases, we may be slow, and so we can keep the drug at the target for longer than expected, and then some negative side effects may develop. Now, the drug companies all over the world has been putting billions of euros or dollars in trying to develop specific <coughs> dosages of their drugs for the different populations, for the Asians, for the Europeans, for the Blacks, and so on and so forth. But they failed, they wasted their money, because here, dosage for a specific market really means race. This might have worked if all the people in Asia had the same speed in processing drugs and all the people in Europe had a different speed. And instead, here we have an example of people with genetic variants that do not work, that decrease their speed, that are normal or that increase the speed of drug processing. And the different colors represent different populations. And as you see, there are differences among populations. But in each and every population, you have the complete range of possibilities, from very slow people to slow people to people who look normal, between inverted commas, to people who are faster. So if someone says uh, that uh, a racial classification is useful for medicine, the answer is no, it isn't, it isn't. And look at this, you know, the, <clears throat> the, the bone marrow associations all over the world are involved in creating big databases in which they can find people who can donate their bone marrow and so solve some severe cases of leukemia. Here you have a kid whose life was saved by the donation of bone marrow from this other guy to the left. Their names are Michael Menafee and Jackson Slade. Of course, no person who believes in racial classification would have ever tried to look at the DNA of uh, the guy to the left, uh, hoping to find uh, the bone marrow that is most compatible with uh, the recipient, Jackson Slade. So <clears throat> a racial classification is a prejudice that may prevent us from finding the right uh, solution to a number of medical, medical problems. Now, I would really like to know if you want me to stop at this point, uh, uh, Cecilia. Uh, yes, or, may, maybe, or if you want to conclude. No, 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 no. I, I, have five minutes. Few, I have a few funny things to yeah, show. Yeah, yeah, show, show, okay. Let me show you something funny so that people who got to sleep during the first part of my talk perhaps will wake up. Uh, let me speak briefly about uh, what is called the recreational genetics, because all the knowledge that we developed on our genome, of course, uh, 
yes to people who want to make money by selling us our, our genome. And there are several services to which you may refer, and you can pay between $90 to $150 to get some information on your, on your DNA and possibly on your origins. Now, the mechanism whereby this is done is rather obscure. But basically, you have your genome here, and you have a number of populations to which you are compared. And then some distances are calculated from which, through a mathematical process that is never well clarified because it's a commercial secret, these people don't tell you how they do, this is turned into percentage of ancestry from the various populations. But of course, when we say Africa, in Africa we have many, many different people. So these are averages. Once again, we are treating all these populations as if the people within them were equal, but they are not. So the story I want to tell you is the story of uh, <coughs> someone whose DNA was taken for this test. And here you can see, you can see the outcome of one of these tests. Your DNA is divided in percentages, 95 19.5% European, 29% South Asian, and so on and so forth. But I would like to call your attention to the subtypes of European that are considered in this test. You can be Southern European from you know, the Iberian, Penin Iberian Peninsula, Italy, the Balkans, Northern Europeans from France to Lapland, Eastern Europeans, and then you can be Ashkenazi. Now, this is a bit strange, you know, because uh, Ashkenazi means Austria, Hungary, Poland, the Czech Republic, uh, Slovakia. Why is that so? It's so because uh, these companies offer their services uh, mostly to American customers, among whom uh, there are many Jews from uh, Central Europe. These Jewish people don't like to be told uh, you are Polish, you are from Poland, because the Poles were those who destroyed their villages. And in order to please the customers, then this company and others decided that everybody coming from Central Europe would be Ashkenazi, so their Jewish customers would not complain. And now let me tell you the story, here is the same thing, of this guy, William Patrick Stuart Houston. Do you know him? Does he remind you of someone? You will see he's related to someone you know pretty well. Anyway, this guy was eating his lunch in a diner in Long Island, close to New York. And when he left uh, the restaurant, someone came out of the shade and stole uh, the napkin with which uh, William Patrick Stuart Houston had cleaned his lips. This someone was uh, a journalist from Belgium. And this way, he stole some cells from the lips of uh, William Patrick Stuart Houston and had them typed and had them <clears throat> and had their genome read. Now, why was this uh, Belgian journalist so interested in his genome? Because uh, William is uh, the son of Alois Jr. Does he remind you of someone? Someone well known? And Alois Jr. was half-brother of this guy who certainly you heard about. Now, the genealogy of the Hitler family is rather complicated because of their father, Alois Sr., had the children with three women. Here I simplified that their <coughs> family tree. Adolf comes from one branch, Alois Jr. and William Patrick from the other one. Uh, as you know, uh, Adolf Hitler's body is uh, nowhere to be found. But uh, Alois Sr., Alois Jr., Adolf and William Patrick have something in common, the white chromosome. So by studying the DNA of William Patrick, who of course changed his surname because being called Hitler is not a good idea, at least in the United States. In Italy, you can go, you can be elected to the Senate even if your name is Mussolini, but that, that's a specific feature of my country. Well, because it's not a good idea to be called Hitler, William Patrick changed his last name. And so the journalist had a sample within which the Y chromosome was identical to Hitler's Y chromosome. And then he sent uh, the sample to be typed uh, at the company that we talked about, uh, whose name I won't reveal. And you know, Hitler's family was from Linz in Austria, so it ended up uh, there. And then the newspapers published uh, this uh, <coughs> shocking news, uh, Hitler was Jewish. Of course, Hitler was not Jewish. Hitler came from an area in which Jewish and non-Jewish people 
are very similar genetically because they live close to one another. They have more contact for centuries than we may imagine. But in the meantime, uh, the voice had spread. Uh, and so on Haaretz, uh, the <coughs> Israel newspapers, uh, this picture appeared of Adolf Hitler with a very sad expression, uh, dressed in a way he would have never imagined in his uh, whole lifetime. And I think that at this point, uh, I better shut up and let you ask questions if you want. Thank you for your attention. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Guido and for this excellent presentation about our evolution and expansion out of Africa. And also you show how the situation of our species is much more complex than we imagined before. Uh, so now we open uh, the, the session for a question. And uh, if you want, you can uh, write any question. I, I see I'm seeing that there is already a question. Uh, Guido, are you, are you seeing? Or um, I can read for you. No, I was wondering since you said that when Homo sapiens migrated to the east, uh, maybe he found some Neander. Oh, oh, OK. There's a question about our relationship uh, with Neanderthals. I must warn you, I'm the wrong person to ask. <clears throat> In science, we don't have a way to say what is true. We have a way to reject the hypotheses when they don't prove to match the data. But we don't know what is true. And so the only thing we have is the consensus of the experts. So we have to believe what most people say. And I happen to be now in the minority group who doesn't think that we had much to do with Neanderthals during our expansion from Africa. But first, let me tell you about the data and then about the possible interpretations. Um, the first uh, genetic studies of Neanderthals were based on a small component of the genome called mitochondrial DNA, transmitted by the mothers to the children. So it marks uh, the evolution of our female lines. And uh, the mitochondrial DNA of Neanderthals is clearly distinct from ours. So <clears throat> by reading the mitochondrial DNA, you can tell with 100% precision whether it comes from a Neanderthal or from a sapiens, okay? <clears throat> Recently, also the Y chromosome, which is transmitted only along the male lines was typed of Neanderthals. And once again, the Y chromosome of Neanderthals uh, proved to be different from ours. <clears throat> so people thought that this was a proof that we and Neanderthals were different species, which is also something you can tell based on the, on the skeletons. Because whenever you have a complete skeleton, there's a clear difference between us and them. Giorgio Manzi, who is my reference paleontologist, uh, taught me this trick, uh, which I'm happy to share with you. If you put uh, the skull uh, <coughs> in profile <coughs> and it looks like a rugby ball, then it's a Neanderthal. If it looks like a football, it's us. And this is because our forehead had this uh, big development uh, to, to <coughs> uh, because it's occupied by a, a, an enormous development of the frontal, of the regions of the frontal cortex. Okay, when uh, it uh, came to reading the whole genome of Neanderthals, and this was done in 2010, then the results were different because there was a greater overlap between their DNA and ours. Not only that, but uh, people from uh, Europe, Asia, Melanesia, and even the Americas look closer to Neanderthals than the African people. The difference is not large, it's between 2 and 4 percent, but it's constant uh, no matter who you take uh, from these continents. Uh, uh, in comparison with Neanderthals, uh, people from uh, outside Africa are more similar. Now, this may mean two things. The most common interpretation, not mine, is that uh, when we left Africa 7,000 years ago, we interbred with Neanderthals. This interbreeding had major consequences because everybody, everybody all over the world who is not in Africa received some genes from this interbreeding. So it was not an occasional flirt. It was something involving the whole population of people getting out of Africa. 
to explain the other option, <clears throat> I will have to make an example. We are more similar to, can to chimpanzees than to kangaroos, not because we had sex with chimpanzees. Maybe we did, we don't know, but this was not common. But because we share with chimpanzees a longer evolutionary period, kangaroos are separated from us earlier on. So it's possible, it's conceivable, it can be shown with numbers, that the greater similarity of Europeans and Asians with Neanderthals comes from the fact that the ancestors of Neanderthals moved from Northern Africa into Europe and Asia. And our ancestors also come from Northern Africa. And so the average African, including Southern and Western Africans, is more distant from Neanderthals than we are. From the numerical standpoint, uh, both theories can account for all the results that we have found so far. Now, we have proof that interbreeding at least once occurred, because a skeleton from Romania dated at, uh, if I will remember, um, 28,000 years ago, but I may be wrong. The place is called Peștera Cuoase, which means cavern with bones. <clears throat> This skeleton, which is unfortunately incomplete, so we don't have the skull, has a given DNA from which we can tell that this guy or this lady had a, um, an ancestor, a Neanderthal ancestor, four generations before. So the interbreeding did occur in Oase and perhaps in other places. The big question is whether this was something that affected all humankind or just a specific factor. In my opinion, there is not enough evidence to claim that all of us preserve in our DNA the traces of this interbreeding. And now let me say why I think so. <clears throat> if this happened, it may have happened only in two ways. Neanderthal ladies mating with sapiens gentlemen or vice versa. In the first case, I would expect that, that some Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA would be present in current population, and there isn't. In the other case, I would expect that some Y chromosomes of Neanderthals would be present in current populations, but we have never found them. To this objection, the supporters of the interbreeding option, who are the majority, I insist on my colleagues, including very, very reliable experts, say that perhaps in the hybrids, there was a negative selection against Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome. This is, of course, uh, a possibility, but I don't think it's a scientific hypothesis because we have no way to prove it. We would need a Neanderthal man and a Neanderthal woman, possibly, interbreeding with us to see if their descendants, if their offspring, has some disadvantages in inheriting the Y chromosome or the mitochondrial DNA of Neanderthals. So I still think the field is open for discussion, but most of the experts you could talk with of this problem would have told you, no, there is no problem. We interbred with Neanderthals, and signs of this interbreeding are present in all populations out of Africa. All right. So more questions that you might have and you want to pose. So feel free to write it here on the, the, the chat. Um, I have one question for you, Guido. Yeah. Um, so I'm quite familiar with the, the, the work of Cavalli Sforza. Can you talk us a bit about the, the relationship between genetics and languages? So is there any relationship? What, uh, what can you tell us about yeah. Yeah, uh, do, you, do we have six hours to talk about this? <laughs> <laughs> no, just a, a brief, so, very brief. Let me, you know, I, I always find myself in trouble uh, with you, I don't know why, because frankly, you know, I participated uh, in the good old times in the 80s uh, with these projects, but I was not in Luca Cavalli's Forza's group, I was in Robert Sokol's group. Okay. So the main, the main opponent of Luca Cavalli's Forza, who, even though he kissed me every time we met, I think never forgave me for being part uh, of, the, of the opposite party. <laughs> this is a long-standing idea in, uh, in, uh, in biology. You know, even Charles Darwin, who, as you may know, wanted to avoid as much as possible talking about humans because he knew he would get in trouble, wrote at a certain point uh, that if we had available the evolutionary tree of human populations, that would be our best reconstruction of the linguistic tree of human populations. 
So there was this intuition <coughs> that uh, biological evolution and linguistic change proceed in parallel. Darwin's uh, was just an idea. He never started working on that. And uh, <coughs> serious uh, analysis of the data began in the 80s. And I must say that uh, Sokal's group published his first paper in April eight, 1988, whereas Cavalli's group published it in November 1988. But I think this is a stupid discussion, I mean, at this point, who was the first? Because some ideas uh, are in the air. You know, people talk about them, talk even before publishing papers, and so on and so forth. In both cases, the idea was that, uh, in general, the same processes that lead to genetic uh, divergence, which is basically isolation, as I said before, mm -hmm. also lead to linguistic diversification. And the same processes that lead to genetic convergence, gene flow migration, also lead to cultural exchanges, uh, potentially causing linguistic change. Mm -hmm. This is a general scheme, but we know that there are many exceptions. And we know that by history, for instance, we know that in the Middle Age, people came from Asia into Hungary, and the language changed, and uh, an Asian language was introduced in Hungary. Even though the majority of the genes of the populations were not affected, because that was an army. It was a small group of people, and not the entire population of Mongolia coming into Hungary. So there are many processes that can disturb the basic uh, positive correlation between languages and genes. Now, the good thing is that uh, we can learn both uh, from observing the rule, observing these correlations, but also from observing that there are exceptions to this rule, like in Hungary. So the Hungarians are genetically very close to their European neighbors, are linguistically very different, and this allows us to have an idea of their you know, <coughs> cultural, <coughs> cultural change. Um, there are limitations to these approaches. One, you, you, you want to say something, I can see it from your lips. Now I, I have uh, other questions here, so... Uh, okay, <laughs> so to finish, to finish now, uh, I mean, many, many, mm, many important papers were based on comparison of uh, the vocabularies of the languages and of the genes. Because by comparing the words, uh, you can uh, come up with measures of linguistic distance, uh, easy to statistically compare with measures of genetic distance. <clears throat> So we built three, we found exceptions in these three. We marked on the map borders. Uh, you know, I, I developed, uh, when I was young, a program to mark on the map of the lines showing the highest areas, the areas of highest genetic and linguistic change, very funny things. Um, linguists are not uh, super happy about what the geneticists are doing. For a number of reasons, if you want, uh, we can discuss them. The main reason, uh, the main, the reason with, I think with the most scientific importance is that uh, languages are not an assemblage of words. Yes. They also have a grammar, a syntax. But if you want to compare languages at the vocabulary level, you just need the vocabulary. To reconstruct syntax, uh, it's much more complicated. But there's a colleague of mine with whom I collaborated, uh, Pino Longobardi from York, who is now working at the broad classification of syntaxes in the world. So we will have better data to work on in the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for uh, your <coughs> welcome. But I'm sure you quite. Uh, I will invite you to do just a, a talk on that on that subject. Yeah, yeah. Right, so Can I'm the answer to the. To please, the, there is another question. Yeah, I see the SARS-CoV-2. Yes. So I can, yeah. Perhaps I can read the questions from Katrin yeah. Gija. So, uh, so she's saying that an extremely important topic to discuss. Okay, thank you. Even during this COVID-19 pandemic, there, there were news of some group with some level of Neanderthal ancestry who had different susceptibility, I have that. Okay, sorry. Susceptibility. To the SARS-CoV-2, so I can imagine some people start testing for their susceptibility would you like to comment? So is there a difference? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I must say that uh, I didn't read in detail that paper. So you know, uh, I will only say something superficial. What I know is that uh, in these cases, uh, you, you compare people who have been affected by a disease with people who have not been affected, trying to see if in their genome there are some differences. And uh, this study on uh, COV-2 victims showed the two areas of the genome in which there were differences. One is an area in which uh, um, some people believe that there has been a 
an input of Neanderthal genes in our genome. And the other one is the ABO blood group. Uh, people of the O blood group, I say it with pride, even though I have no merit for that, uh, seem to be more protected uh, uh, <clears throat> from COVID infection than uh, you people from the AB or even worse AB blood group. This is very, very unclear. I don't know why. Even though you know the ABO blood group uh, contributes to the surface of the cells, uh, and so the virus will find these proteins at a certain moment, but it's very unclear why things are like that. As for the Neanderthal, I cannot I cannot comment. Only you know let's uh, let's wait a little bit before blaming our diseases uh, on Neanderthals. Because it's very unclear how many of us have these uh, genes from Neanderthals. So something that almost all of us have them from Neanderthals. I am not so sure. I'm not so sure. Anyway, it, it can make sense in general. All right. Other questions that I just received from um, uh, my, in my phone. So um, concerning also this the, about the, the COVID situation. So if uh, the, the vaccine is only test. Uh, in, uh, for example, in the European population, how can we be sure that the vaccine will work for the entire world? We cannot, but you know, I, I, I would like to specify, so far I try to speak of things that I think I know fairly well or sometimes pretty well. Now we are talking of something about which I have done no personal study. So I, you know, I read the newspapers like everybody. I <clears throat> read some scientific papers, but by, I am by no means an expert, okay? So take my word as the word of a non-expert. Um, we cannot be sure that the vaccine will work for everybody because we are genetically different and we have no idea of the interactions that are certainly complicated between the virus and us. Uh, as far as I understand, uh, we haven't been able to say so far why people <coughs> with uh, even high uh, presence of the virus within their body show very mild symptoms or none at all and some other people is the, the show very, very strong symptoms, possibly leading them to die sometimes. So all this question is very, very complicated. Um, I know that Pfizer, but also I think Moderna, tested uh, their vaccine over several populations worldwide. I'm sure they included Brazil, because one of the difficult cases came exactly from Brazil. But it is true, I don't think these, uh, these vaccines were tested in Africa. Uh, we can say that this reflects once again uh, a Eurocentric bias in scientific research, this is obvious. We can also say, if we want uh, <clears throat> to be a little bit uh, more flexible, that uh, it's in part inevitable that since research about these vaccines is carried out, I would like to add, with incredible, incredible speed because it took 20 years uh, to develop influenza vaccines. And now we are doing everything in a year. Because if things are done in an emergency, then uh, we must be sloppy in, in, a, in part. But certainly, 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 we don't know how this would work in uh, African people as far as we don't try. And more than that, uh, probably the word African should be avoided because uh, as I try to show, Africa harbors uh, some of the greatest, largest differences between humans. So two Africans may be more different than an African and a European. So there's uh, a broad unknown area here. And uh, the justification for that is that uh, the faster we proceed, the better, or at least so it seems at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank okay. you. So one more question from uh, Ricardo. He thanks uh, your presentation. And he, he posed two questions. So the first one is, how on balance is still sampling and the number of available samples from the different parts of the world? Mm -hmm. I suppose this is um, about the, yeah. the genetic uh, differentiation and diversity. And the second is, uh, how is widespread and inclusive, inclusive sampling policies improving historical evolutionary knowledge and health? Yeah, I mean, initially, initially the sampling was, of course, unbiased. You know, the first genomes were all genomes, uh, not only of European, you know, people of European origin, but of people who actually worked in the labs, you know, 
Jim Watson, <coughs> great inventor. So you go next room and you say to the emeritus professor, would you like your genome to be, to be typed? And of course the professor says yes. But this is getting better. And if you remember the map I showed with the four colors, then there is a reasonably, good, a reasonably good coverage of the map of the world. Of course, uh, isolated uh, populations are not part of the center. And uh, so these populations are at risk, both because they are small and because we know very little of them. Um, the old policies in which you know, the Western uh, investigators uh, came, moved into an Amazonian village and took the blood from the people, um, were very negative because of this caused some negative reactions. And so now there are many small populations which we would like to study for, you know, for health reasons and who refuse to donate their samples to the, to the Western investigators. So there's a problem there, there's a problem there. But the problem is getting milder and milder because the sampling is proceeding. Uh, health is uh, provided uh, <clears throat> huge benefits uh, to the way we handle the health. Of course, from the knowledge standpoint, we know an, a lot of things uh, we didn't know before. So knowledge, uh, evolutionary knowledge, uh, evolu knowledge on our diversity has improved dramatically. Our ability to actually solve health problems uh, has improved very little in the last years. When uh, <clears throat> the Human Genome Project was started, uh, James Watson, who was one of the main proponents of the project, uh, said something that proved to be radically wrong. He said, we used to think that our fate was written in the stars, and now we know it's in the DNA, with the implication, give me your DNA and it will tell you everything about you. Now, we have all James Watson's uh, DNA, and we cannot say, based on that DNA, how tall is Jim Watson. And uh, in many, many cases, uh, the progress uh, has been hampered by the fact uh, that the most interesting uh, uh, diseases, the most serious diseases, do not depend on the action of one or two genes, in which case uh, we would be able to put our fingers on the genes and say, okay, let's work here and here. Let's modify one of them. Now we have the techniques to modify single genes. But the most important uh, factors for public health are <clears throat> depend on a large number of genes and we are still disoriented there. And we still do not know, cannot tell, for instance, how many genes are involved in the origin of diabetes, let alone you know, more, more complicated diseases like uh, circulatory diseases. So the progress in health uh, has not been substantial in the last, uh, let's say, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And there is a comment of Katarina Ginja. Mm -hmm. uh, the comment is, but I assume there are some contexts where the identification of this variety of populations could be useful. For example, for the management of animal population, both domestic, domesticated or wild. No, she's, she's right. You know, I was not saying that I am against uh, differences or that I am against uh, all sorts of uh, sub-structuring populations and looking for subspecies or races within them. I was just saying that uh, it has been proved, I think, that uh, for research on humans, these labels uh, uh, don't work, don't work. We actually started understanding the story of our migrations, uh, our African origins and so on and so forth when we abandoned racial labels. You know, for, for, for many, many reasons. One is that uh, insofar as you classify Africans as a single unit or sub-Saharan Africans as a single unit, you miss uh, a large share of human diversity. So these labels in humans don't work. In, uh, in, uh, you know, in, uh, in uh, conservation biology, uh, these classifications are actually used, are actually uh, useful, provided that the species is subdivided in subspecies. So for, you know, if you are worried about tuna, don't, don't use this type of approach because in tuna you will never find anything even remotely resembling a subspecies. And if you need more tuna in the Pacific Ocean, you can take them from the Indian Ocean, it will be the same. Um, if, you want, if you want to reintroduce wild bear 
in some areas of the world, then make sure that the place you want to take your brown birds from has a similar genetic assets. Because sometimes uh, this way, it happened with wild boar in Italy, you replace the population with a different population. Um, the Italian wild boar has basically disappeared from the peninsula, it's only present in Sardinia now, because a few years ago, wild boars were introduced from Hungary, and these uh, Hungarian wild boars proved much better at living in Italy than the Italian ones, and the Italian ones were basically replaced by them, and only were saved in Sardinia. So yes, the, the concept of a subspecies or race may be useful in many areas in which we have to manage uh, the flora or the fauna. Okay, perhaps we still have time for one more last question, so anyone wants to, to pose it? Feel free or write it in the chat. Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> I have one question. It's a very simple and difficult question. Okay. Um, <laughs> If you uh, and our geneticists and uh, anthropologists uh, demonstrated that the word race doesn't have any sense, why, in your opinion, do people, media, and the general public continue to use it? <laughs> well, I, I think that if Adolf Hitler could uh, listen to this talk and other more authoritative talks, uh, he wouldn't pick up the phone to tell us, oh, I'm sorry, he said so many stupid things. <clears throat> when we're speaking of racism, we're not speaking of the biological differences uh, among people. We're speaking of the people's right, the right to access to instruction, uh, resources. And uh, this subject, uh, doesn't even really require that the races exist in the biological world. Think about this. I can say you cannot do this because you are a Negro, because you are Muslim, or because you are an immigrant. Yeah. The three sentences are the same, but only the first one is, strictly speaking, racist. You can replace Negro with immigrant or with a religious definition. Or you can replace it simply with the statement that you don't have my passport. And then these policies of exclusions will be equally effective. So I think that uh, we should uh, abandon the idea that biology can help us solve problems that are rooted in our psychological, economical, uh, sociological structure. Because uh, you know, uh, I think that biological studies may help uh, uh, deconstruct a myth, the myth that people behave differently because this is hardly hardwired in their genes. No, this is not true. This is not true. But then uh, it's complicated to live with people who have different habits, <clears throat> uh, cook food at a different time, uh, make noise when we want to sleep, and perhaps compete with us uh, for some jobs. It takes an effort. We have to acknowledge this. I think the, the most important point is that the alternative to this effort to coexist with people who have different habits and with whom there can be conflicts is an extension of the conflict. If we don't learn to live in a multicultural society, we will be fighting every day of our life for the next many, many years because the level of inequalities in the world is such that the migration processes will not stop tomorrow, even if we build a wall around Europe or between the US and Mexico, as we have seen. So I think we should not deny <clears throat> that living in a multicultural society is complicated and takes an effort from many of us. I think we should emphasize that the alternatives to this effort seem hopeless. That I think would be the point uh, to discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Guido. Thank you, everybody, for participating. So I'm going to pass the, 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 the words to our head of department, uh, Fatima, just to say some uh, closing words. And 
from my side. Thank you very much, much for your fascinating and impressive, and I can now imagine how it will be in person. So You just have to invite me to Lisbon to see how it's uh, done in person. <laughs> yes, next time. <laughs> can I say a hi Thank to Silvia so Guimaraes, uh, whom I haven't seen in many ages. Uh, ciao, Silvia. Thank you, Guido. Thank you so much for Thank being here. Okay, uh, thank you very much for this brilliant lecture you gave, uh, gave us here today. I would like to thank you immensely for being here with us. It was very, very enlightening. Uh, also, I'd like to thank to the audience which uh, stood with us for these two hours and again to Rui and Cecilia for organizing this lecture uh, in 2020. Best of all, e, Professor Guido, I hope we can meet in personally here in Lisbon in, uh, in the future. I, I do hope so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all. Thank you, Guido. Stay, stay well and stay safe, everybody. See you next time. Ciao. Ciao, ciao.